Welcome everyone. Uh, today we are having uh, Jennifer Hassler from Georgia Tech and we'll keep uh, going through the neuromorphic uh, engineering uh, topics. She has been um, like doing, uh, she has a bachelor and master's from Arizona State in uh, electrical uh, and engineering and uh, was one of the original students of Carver Mead at Caltech uh, for like the computational neural systems uh, program uh, that she graduated in uh, 97 and then joined um, Cal uh, Georgia Tech uh, right after that. Yeah. Um, she has been influential in um, the field of uh, field programmable uh, analog arrays and uh, has like a very nice paper on a roadmap for uh, Large scale neuromorphic system, which are uh, like from 2013, uh, that kind of set up some of the standards of like what the field or where the field uh, might and should go. Um, and today she's going to talk about uh, neuromorphic computation, but also like uh, different uh, other forms of uh, physical computations mm -hmm. and what people are doing at uh, Georgia Tech in general, I think, uh, in terms of computations. So without further ado, uh, uh, Jennifer, I will uh, let you talk. Thank you. And uh, please, like, uh, thank you uh, very much. It's meant I to, appreciate sorry, it. It's meant to be informal, so just uh, interrupt her. Like, she she would like to have like uh, an open discussion. Like, so like you yeah. are encouraged to just like ask your questions directly uh, without putting it in the chat or raising your hands. Yeah. Thank you. Um. And, and I will reiterate that. Well, the first thing I'll say is first, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate being able to just have like have the conversation. Number two is please do like have conversations and and vocally say something because I will when I share my screen I may not be able to tell if you've raised your hand or put something in the chat unless someone reads it to me vocally. So I really would love there to be a conversation. Um, I have slides of things, and I'm perfectly happy if we get derailed into twenty different directions from there. Uh, so just know that. Okay. So I, I sort of decided to keep the title very general just because, you know, overview of what we do in Georgia Tech. When I mean Georgia Tech, I mean my group. Let's just, I'll just be honest. There may be other things, but um, we've done sort of things. You know, I'm going to talk today really about the things that, that I have thought about. And um, in terms of some of the stuff I've worked with in my group, um, this is my 25th year at Georgia Tech. Um, I've been, you know, before that I was at Caltech for, uh, for five years. Before that, I actually was at Arizona State and I actually did neuromorphic work while I was there. So I realized that the first sort of thing I've worked on that was related to neuromorphic sort of things, or at least the first publication I had was in 1988. Um, so gotten a chance to see the field quite a bit. So, um, happy to have any conversations around where all that's going. Um, I will say that when I think about neuromorphic computing, I tend, I tend to start in these directions. Um, the first view is I'm just really amazed by how the brain computes, period. Um, you know, this is just the most amazing machine. And if you look at what it's capable of doing, the kind of processing levels you're talking about are, you know, 10,000 or more petamax per second. Um, you know, to talk about what is a Petamac, you know, that, you know, that's about an IBM Sequoia. Like it's a whole room servers kind of thing. And you can power a few of these with like, you know, a hydroelectric dam. Um, and that gives you a perspective of what that is. But this, but all of the amazing computing it does is, you know, 20 watts. Somebody will tell me it's 15. Somebody will tell me it's 12, whatever. Well, let's go with, you know, order of magnitude, we're all about in the same place. And what's cool is it's actually powered by, you know, like food. Um, I, I tend to be a high, a good, tend to be a fan of Japanese curry. So I'd rather like that, or sometimes I'll use green chilies or a few other things. Um, but I'm just always amazed that this is what powers it. And what's actually interesting is that if you look closely at the brain, it is actually very energy constrained. This is one of the most important pieces of it that, um, and it's constrained because the brain typically is using somewhere about 20 to 25% of um, the power in the body, you know, resting, resting power. So to just say, oh, well, we'll just increase something by a factor of 10 means you have to eat, say, twice as much. And it's only been in, you know, the last century or two that a sizable number of the population can get enough calories that that's actually a real thing. And maybe we'll evolve into doing more things, but 
that's where we are today. Um, and so there's a whole question of like, you know, what is the computing and the approach? And one of them came from, uh, you know, there's a, a gentler paper in IEEE Spectrum you know, that came in 2017. There was sort of the roadmap paper that was talked about. And that turns out to be pretty important. When I look at the history of this, it gets kind of interesting because when you start talking about, you know, neurons, there's a whole bunch of cool stuff and such diversity of neurons and we can get into all of the various pieces. But when we talk about neuromorphic engineering at its very heart is the sense of understanding neuro, neurobiology and looking at it and how we put that into electronic medium and electronic forms and, and, and so forth. And in some sense, understanding it so we can put it there. But then the, the rest of the loop is important is, well, in so doing and in so building, we understand things. And in that way, it allows us then to ask important questions of neuroscience and bring it back. And that I think is really important um, to kind of understand there's that full loop in the conversation. Um, people ask, where's the various historical starting points for this? And, you know, we could always go back to things like Rosenblatt and some other things further back. But, you know, I think a lot of people would usually hit the, the real sort of major starting point comes out of Caltech in the early 80s. And you had this time when you had Feynman, Hopfield, and Carver Mead, um, all kind of being together pretty much about the time when Hopfield started there. And, you know, they basically got together a couple of times that there's clearly stuff at the interface here, but we don't know what it is. And in complete Caltech fashion, being a Caltech grad, I can say this, complete Caltech fashion, how do they approach it? I know, I'll teach a class and then we'll understand it. And that's actually what they did. They ended up teaching a year long course in 1981 and 82. It very quickly became three courses, one that each of them taught for a full year. Uh, and then eventually became a degree program in 1986, which you know is kind of a, a weak hurdle at Caltech, but it, was, it became computation neural systems, which was my PhD. Um, and just had some amazing sort of things. Eventually became a book in 1989 on analog BLSI and neural systems. And almost within three or four years, some of the material is outdated but the core and the original perspective in that book is amazing. And I, I would still, I still recommend so many of the chapters of that book to anyone doing even just traditional analog circuit design, not to mention analog uh, neuromorphic design. And so the history is really important if you, you know, or maybe may or not be aware of it. Um, and it's pretty neat to see that. Then you get to the questions of, well, you know, why would I do analog computing? You know, why would I do physical computing? Why would I do neuromorphic computing? Feel free to insert a few other things. Physical computing, by the way, is computing over any real values. So it allows you to insert anything else you want in there. Like, uh, why would I do quantum computing? Why would I do optical computing? Again, all of those are real value computing concepts. And they're all equivalent at one level. Um, or actually, they're all, there's equivalencies across them is the way to put it. Well. There was a core argument that came from Carver Mead in 1990. It's a wonderful paper on IEEE proceedings. And if you haven't read it, I, I just strongly recommend it because it outlines so much of it. And just for historical reasons, it's pretty incredible. And Carver really talked about the sense that for digital and analog computing, that you know, analog computing should have be about a factor of 10,000, or well, I think he actually said somewhere closer to 10,000 energy efficiency compared to digital go 100,000 to 10,000 X, and that the size should be like 100 X. And the whole argument was, if I deal like a 16-bit multiplier, I have to shift a whole bunch of elements. I have to have a whole bunch of digital bits flip. And there's lots of transistors per logic element. And so there's, and you start doing a counting argument versus an analog, I really only need a couple of transistors to make that work. Um, and the size, yeah, my analog transistors might be a little bigger, but still I'm going to be winning an area. And so those sort of very basic concepts and there's a few other things in there really sets what you're trying to do with it, you know, really kind of sets some of these questions. And so you're like, oh, well, that's interesting. And you're like, well, okay, yeah, but why would I care about this? And the reason I care about this is that, you know, digital kind of hit sort of this, you know, limits of energy and power efficiency and arguably one of the first conversations around this is the, is the uh, energy efficiency wall that was, um, I mean, the first paper on this, again, was 
quite a while ago. And this was also in 2013, I believe. And what's amazing about it is that, you know, again, it was, it was actually sort of tracking yeah, everybody expect everything went by Denard's law. And then after a certain point, things just started flattening out. When you start actually looking at multiply, multiply ads or multiply accumulates of a certain size across and normalized across process nodes. Um, and interesting enough, for those of you who are circuit people, the reason for that is that mismatch in the transistors started causing issues that you had to scale scale certain sizes and then scaling the sizes of the capacitance didn't drop the way you thought it would. Um, and so, and by the way, these are on experimental numbers of things that are product or near product kind of yields. So it had to yield. So, and, and that's why you could actually see the issue. It, it's kind of interesting because what that says is, you know, it's still pretty incredible, right? Because if I look at say from the first DSP chips, you know, 1978 or so, so the speak and spell, uh, if you are old enough to remember that, that probably says something right there. But um, I remember those toys as a child. Um, to about now for the energy efficiency wall is about a factor of a thousand in energy efficiency. It's pretty darn amazing that we had all of these things happen. And yet here's the thing, this factor of a thousand energy efficiency from here down to the analog is another factor of a thousand. So it basically says we've hit the geometric mean. Um, so what we've seen happen over the last 30 to 40 years can be completely replicated again. And that's pretty darn cool. Um, by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, this was his hypothesis in 1990. It was clearly definitively addressed in 2004 in doing vector matrix multipliers and been addressed many, many times in many different ways in many different places. And, I'm sure if Gert is on the call, Gert can also say that there's some things he did too, and, and rightfully so, and, and highly appreciative of his efforts on these things as well. Um, you begin to see a whole range of possibilities there, and there's probably some further range in there. But what's interesting is that I also noticed that when you look at actual you know, neurons, um, there's even more range to go in terms of the computing. And you start to realize there's certain computing approaches, when you start getting more neuromorphic in the way you approach it, you actually get more energy efficient. Um, and so, for example, the whole conversation of why should I use dendrites? Uh, well, because it looks like the coincidence detection that you get out of dendritic behavior gives you some very, very powerful computing capabilities um, that, and that really give you net several orders of magnitude more efficiency. So I like to think about this particular view as sort of the equivalent to, to Feynman's perspective when he talked about, you know, there's plenty of room at the bottom. I, I think today people go, oh, well, all the digital scaling we flattened out. I'm like, there's so much more room at the bottom here. We've got so much more room to go. And I think there's some incredible things that are possible here. And so that's kind of the overall like starting argument for this of could you do this and, you know, why would you do these things? It's energy efficient. You could talk about an area equivalent. There's a couple other metrics to do this as well, but this is why we do it. This is why you care. It goes back to that 20 watts of power versus you know, hydroelectric dams. The issue when you get there is the fact that computing in digital is something we understand well. Computing in digital is something that we just pull up our laptop like I am doing today to give a talk or a tablet or a phone. And when we do that, there is a huge amount of infrastructure in there. <laughs> and it's programmable and it's configurable. And we're used to writing code and having bases of codes and all of that. And when you think about analog, most people have, I would say, not positive opinions of thinking about a soldering iron on boards and thinking that it's fixed function, it's custom design, there's scars somewhere from an undergraduate class where you're forced into measuring stuff. Maybe not everybody, but I think there's a lot of that that goes on. And so this is the way everyone tends to believe. And so you, when you look at this, you go, yeah, okay, maybe analog, but this just sounds horrible and painful. And I don't care how much energy efficiency it is. This is gonna take me forever compared to doing this. Fair enough. If that's your only choice is I, the argument is fair. The reality is that isn't the only choice. Um, and the one of the things, some of the things we worked on as an example 
is these things that are large scale field programmable analog arrays uh, or FPAs. And, and what's interesting about it is it allows you to have a system that looks like an FPGA, but is analog mixed signal, but still, you know, it's a full system, right? So this is a system on chip structure where you might have a processor and still a whole bunch of low power fabric. And, and so you can even ask the question, well, okay, I could implement this in the digital side or the analog side and I can choose. Let me do the partition, or this is what often is called co-design. Which should I do? It's either an opportunity or a curse, depending on the way you look at the world. Um, but you can actually talk about analog and digital being together, analog being computing, computable, analog being programmable, analog being configurable, and analog having design tools. And if all those points make you go, what? Um, right, then that's probably where these conversations go, but that also then makes all of these conversations actually meaningful. Um, and this certainly has a history to it, um, but before I do anything further, let me just pause for a second and see if people are actually still with me at least, or if there's questions, I'll take that too. Is anybody out there? Anyone just want to say, yeah, you're with, I'm with you? We're all ears. Awesome. Yeah, we're all with you. Yay, cool. All right. Just making sure I didn't lose anybody. People hadn't fallen asleep on me, whatever. All right. Interesting part of virtual. Um, one of the things that's interesting is learning, looking through the history, and maybe because I've lived some of it, I feel like history is important. I like history, so I guess part of it. Um, you know, and you start looking at, you know, I, I think part of the thing that we run into a lot is we, these days often believe that the world started, you know, in terms of neural networks started in about 2013 with deep neural networks, which is kind of fun. Um, and realizing that was just like a really interesting hack that got everybody excited. Um, and that really this stuff has some really deep history, you know, going back to, you know, back to Rosenblatt, going back to Minsky's book on perceptions to try to destroy the field. And then it came back with back propagation um, and, and the whole PDP group, which was, you know, a, a San Diego thing, right? Um, and it was an amazing, you know, amazing to kind of see some of those things there and kind of watch how these happen. Obviously the main sort of big exciting times around digital VLSI was around this time frame, So you know, in the 19, 1980, just to kind of give perspective on it. But then, you know, you start to think, okay, well, and then not much happened, right? And then the deep neural networks happened. And then, you know, maybe if you're kind of a little more familiar, you go, oh, well, there's that DARPA synapse thing and got people excited about doing neural networks or building them and doing memristors and all that stuff, which it, it did. And then the entire program didn't do any of that soon enough, but that's a whole nother story. Um, and by the way, for those of you who haven't seen that, I do a couple of videos. I try to have a lot of online videos, uh, some of which have a certain style and there's some stick figure kind of people of which some of them are sitting on the slide for you. Um, so for those of you who find such things interesting, great. And for those of you who don't, just ignore what I said. Um, but I, I do want to say that there's some things, at least in my own history and things I've worked with that are important. Um, I certainly started doing neural network stuff in the mid 80s, uh, starting about 1987, 86, 87. Um, and what was fun about it, it, you know, there's a lot of energy, much the same way that we see today um, in some of the neural network fields. But one of the biggest things that got us, that just kept stumping us was how do you deal with memory? How do you deal with a memory for weights? How do you deal with those structures? And so there was a couple of really key things. I, I was very fortunate that had, you know, part of my PhD work was talking about these things called single transistor learning synapses. And I'll say a little more about this, but it was basically taking floating gate devices in standard CMOS and been doing it in standard CMOS ever since um, to sort of talk about these things. It was really the, the first sort of computational crossbar. This was actually the, the concept that, that, that created the whole rest of that field. Done in standard CMOS to go, okay, now we actually have these kinds of structures. Um, People want to ask, well, what could have come before it? I'm happy to get into that. Um, probably the only person who would ask me that question would be Gert, um, and that's fair. But this turned out to be interesting because there's a huge amount of effort that continued with it on the neuromorphic side and synapse and so forth. Um, 
you had a number of interesting aspects that started to get into questions of analog computing, uh, including, you know, at least as far as I know, the, the starting paper, what we now know, what we what was actually called at the time and now call computing and memory. Uh, that was that original paper was in 2001. Um, and a whole lot of stuff in looking at acoustics and speech and vision and you know doing vector matrix multiplication and all of that, which is a huge aspect, but on top of it, because after a while building custom chips takes a whole lot of work. If any of you have gotten to partake in such fun, you know the work that it takes. Uh, we started actually looking at a lot of configurable devices that look like FPGAs, but were analog. And the very first ones we built was, you know, right about 2000, 2001. First ones published were in 2002. Um, and they were little, you know, cute little, cute little crossbar networks and floating gate elements, but so much, you know, and they were cute at the time, like, you know, a cute little, cute little child, but they grew up. They grew up after many decades of, of effort. And um, there's some pretty incredible things that come out of those devices. So those are things that we would um, get into a bit. So just going to give a perspective on the history of where some of these things happen and things have continued to develop uh, in, in all these ways. Okay. Such that, you know, if you look at the picture today or you know, in the last five years, it's a pretty typical picture. Not only is this the die photo of, of our large scale kind of device, but um, we also have, you know, and when I talk about using, it's like, for example, acoustic classification, we're doing command word recognition. It's like about 23 microwatts of power. Uh, for this particular form, we've done so many of these kinds of structures. It's kind of cool in terms of doing both embedded learning and classification where the inference still stays at 20, 30 microwatts. Um, you know, and we took, we actually took uh, a database from DARPA, their N0 database, made it about 10 times harder and then still, and still completely crushed it, which was kind of fun, uh, all doing, all doing uh, the training on chip. So that was fun. Um, and so there's a lot we can do. Obviously the training took a little bit more, but because there's a processor and other things on chip, it worked. But it was kind of this neat structure that, you know, because of some of the ways we handled all the floating gate elements and the power and all that, um, you know, the, the programming was straightforward. I can actually take this is one example board, you know, plugged into, um, into a simple smartphone and actually we can actually have an Android system program these boards. We can talk about really having systems that go from sensor all the way to like final computations you want. So very refined data, good constructor, but it also gets around a lot of questions people ask of, oh, I built this sort of simple neural computing piece, but then I got all these, you know, ADCs and DACs around it and whatever. And you're like, what that really is, is an architecture question. You just didn't design the architecture around it uh, for the problem. And if you design the architecture around it for the problem, say going from sensors all the way to the output, it makes it, it kind of works. And having configurable fabrics really allow you to do that where you could say, oh, let me take the input sensor into one of the IO pins and then drive all the way through it. I have a very refined version going in that looks digital. I don't even have to build converters necessarily. I could, I could not do that. Um, as well as a whole tool framework. And we kind of do things, you know, this is actually a picture of a Hodgkin Huxley neuron structure, um, but this is how our tools look, you know, where we actually have stuff sitting in Scilab and Xbox, which is an open source clone of MATLAB and Simulink, where you can actually just draw, take blocks from a palette, put them together, have parameters that actually program directly, uh, quite, quite um, fine grained parameters. And uh, off you get also off you get the nice happy spike patterns. And so all of this sort of becomes a holistic conversation. And this actually drives a lot of other questions going forward. I do notice there's something in the chat. Okay, Gert, what, computing memory well before 2000. Okay, you need to then give me some stuff on that. But I'll leave, you can either do it now or later. I think that was sure. the first time it's actually named. Uh, my <laughs> you phone. know this stuff, right? It's in over here. What is that? You know this stuff, right? Um, I know a lot of stuff, but I'm trying to think of. Can you think of a particular reference that named it? In 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 particularly in, particularly in a non. I mean, there's a. I could believe in the digital architecture space, but in the non-digital architecture space. <laughs> 
Yes, there have been analog uh, arrays, crossbar arrays uh, with uh, CMOS, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Fritz Cup, for instance. Um, uh, this was in the early 90s. Uh, um, Actually, my first paper was also a uh, an array uh, of floating gates. Oh, uh, with oh I'm a rate. Yeah, yeah. You did some you did some nice early work on trying to do some stuff. I know that. Yeah. I, so yeah, there, there clearly were some discussions about it, but actually the sort of the full learning yes. crossbar stuff. And in fact, uh, yeah. Intel even had a chip, a commercial chip, which was e, uh, ETAM. I remember the ETAM. I remember the group. And yes. Yeah. And, uh, and it was floating gate and it was all analog. Yeah. It was floating gate and it had analog and it was a little different game. Obviously, it's a little different from a crossbar perspective, but there were some, there were some pieces of it that, that were done then. That's true. Uh, there were actually uh, crossbar. There was a uh, crossbar race, right? Um, sort of, right? But it was very much of a, um, you were act, it was a, it was a, it was using the, the elements as pure current sources. Obviously, no learn, no no training option in it really, and it, you were doing everything with Gilbert multiplier structures and yeah, yes, yeah. So it's a little different game, but it's I, I don't disagree that it has those it has a similar flavor to it. Yeah, so Chuck Lagerbauer and I noticed we're doing single transistor floating gate elements. Like, yeah, already I remember. Yeah, there was some time with that. So yeah, no, but I, I think the ninety four paper is still the the key. It's kind of like the one that finally pushed it over the edge. I, but I will also give credit that there was some good work done beforehand, and I am thankful for it. Is that fair? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, some good stuff. Um, although the, there's different things. I'm sure, Kurt, we should we should we have not talked about stuff like this in a while. I I, I miss our conversations, my friend. Um, I really do. Anyways, other comments? Glad I looked at the chat. That was cool. Just if uh, if you ever bought one of the Intel ETAN development boards that held eight of their giant ETAN chips in yeah. ZIF sockets and tried yeah. to interface to it, that, that board was made for you, complements of applied neurodynamics. <laughs> OK. OK. Nice. Yeah, that, that does. Yeah, now that you mention it, that's pretty, yeah, that's right. I remember that now. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, it was those are those are interesting times, weren't they? For those who remember it that far back, um, it's it's interesting to see how, in many ways, we've come full circle again, haven't we? So pe people are finally excited about these things again, which is I am very happy about. Cool. Okay, anyone else want to say anything or should I continue? I will continue then. Let me get back in here. Hey. So there are things that get interesting when you start to talk about the FPA structures and, you know, again, can start throwing stuff at a wall and start saying, well, how far can these things go? Um, I think the, the one thing that's interesting at the bottom has been, you know, there's been a, you know, people say, well, it's some interesting simple analog structures, but there's been a lot of things that's been demonstrated over over several years um, that go from, you know, that, that look like, you know, sensor processing and context aware kind of systems. There's a lot of history there, um, but also to, you know, and, and doing vector matrix multiplication. Um, the cool part in the configurable devices was the fact that we learned to be able to do that in the routing fabric. So what you think is basically throwaway fabric turns out to be good analog system computing or spaces, which is kind of neat, actually. So your uh, routing is no longer dead weight. Um, but a lot of other sort of core structures um, and computing thing, you know, obviously things when you get into linear equation solvers, um, doing, you know, compressed sensing reconstruction um, and other things that get into the neural, you know, there's actually some neural interfacing, there's different kind of neural processing, there's stuff on different forms of optimal path planning, um, just, you know, a lot of different things that we tend to think of as algorithms and computing and can kind of do it in structures that we didn't build it, the structure for really any of these, to be honest. Um, we kind of had the structure and went, hmm, what else can we do with it once we get it back? 
and can kind of do these things in very, very power efficient ways. And that turned out to be interesting. And it does make me start asking questions of, well, what would this look like as you start scaling things? And we certainly have done a bit with floating gates and some other elements in terms of where this could scale to. Current, you know, our, our workhorse process for years had been in 350 nanometer CMOS. And for those who aren't up on, on these technology, that's sort of the minimum size channel length to which you can work with. It also is an interesting point because, um, you know, it's a process that would have been state of the art mid nineties. So what was nice for us is it's inexpensive and anyone who's had to deal with, you know, budgeting to do IC design will understand on a university budget that that's a nice thing. Um, so that turned out to be very, very valuable for some of the things we built. But then you begin to ask what happens when you scale to smaller CMOS nodes. And a few things, and there's enough experimental data to, to verify, to validate the, the conversations, although I will have to admit we have not built uh, fully complete large working 40 nanometer or 14 nanometer FPA devices. Um, the specifics I can get into, but uh, how far we've gotten, I can talk about it. But um, to get a sense of where things go pretty realistically, we get a good sense in terms of the, you know, the, what kind of bandwidth you could imagine getting out of these fabrics. Um, you know, right now I would say the 350 nanometer device, you know, you, try to get more than 60 megahertz out, it's pretty painful to get those architectures to work. But as you go a node or two up, you're all of a sudden getting into six gigahertz, which actually this is, this is actually experimental uh, verified kind of numbers um, and on its way up. And so once you get to this level, you all of a sudden go, oh, I can do all sorts of RF things. And, and again, remember we can do vector matrix multiplications and right in the routing fabric. Well, that could be kind of fun. So a lot of things there, but it also then allows you to scale in a sort of quadratic level way. It's almost there. It can, there's, we can talk about the different questions on, on the details, but just how many floating gates you can get and therefore how many also multiply accumulate units you get, for example. It doesn't have to be multiply accumulates. There can be a lot of other things, but that's at least, as you think about neural structures and synapses and all the other things where a lot of that question comes from. So it becomes very interesting there. Um, and so then you can start asking questions. So what are the total you know, amount of, say, VMM computing per second, which is just one of many of things you could do. Uh, and the numbers start getting rather, rather impressive in terms of, of the kind of conversations there. And we can talk about how we normalize that to other kind of computations. Um, but it gets kind of fun to do that. What I really find is that the power efficiency numbers get intriguing. Um, of you know being able to do things and you know gigamac levels in you know gigamac levels say in a 40 nanometer process is what we what we're kind of seeing and aiming at uh, could be at you know a microwatt of power which you know from an energy harvesting perspective is pretty easy to to do uh, or you know and that's pretty incredible what's possible with these kinds of simple devices uh, one giga gigamac is more than you get on your laptop so. Uh, that tells you already there's some interesting things you can do there. Um, and I think the fact that one can talk about neuromorphic kinds of structures allows you to do even more efficient structures. I think there's even more possible as we go for this, go further down. So it's kind of an interesting question of what's possible and, and things that kind of drive us to go, hmm, okay, this overall architecture sound like fun. These are things that we want to keep doing. Um, we enjoy it. This is kind of cool stuff. So, you know, and then, then we get into an interesting set of questions and this kind of gets into the nature of the computing aspect. And, you know, this is relevant whether it's neuromorphic or something else. Um, but before I do that, were there any other comments so far? Don't want to just kind of do a monologue here if no one wants to hear monologue. I think we're good so far. I have a question then. Go ahead. Uh, go back on the, the previous slides you were mentioning yeah, with your neural interfacing um, for FPA. Um, what kind of uh, time constants can you get? Like, are, are those close from biology time constants, or like 
to, you mm. to, to tweak a little bit uh, the, 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 the kind of time constants that you have? Uh, yeah, I, when we've done neuromorphic types of things in these FPA devices, uh, and I don't know if that's a time constant for there for interfacing, um, I mean, certainly the higher end, you get a sense from the, the bandwidth questions, right? They were there. The question might ask is how low can you get into these? Um, you know, the 350 nanometer process, um, you know, we certainly have done time constants that are sub one second, you know, sub one hertz kind of time constants. Um, once you sort of get, you know, sub, you know, 0.1 hertz, you start getting, you start running into leakage questions, but they're certainly not hard to get that far down. Um, you, a little bit of clever design, you could push that a bit further. Um, so if you needed to do, you know, 100 millihertz, it's possible, a little below that, still doable. There are some fun circuit techniques to get further down, but that wasn't necessarily built in some of the current architectures. Um, those get into some of the floating gate adaptation structures, uh, which the current structures don't directly have, but certainly we've done chips to show you could in integrate it in. We just haven't in sort of our recent set of um, devices we've been working with heavily. So um, the interesting question is that when you scale down in process, would that which way would that go? And there's a couple of different circuit questions you have to look at there. Although I would argue it's probably going to be somewhat similar. Although again, you'd still have to use similar size capacitors. Uh, you know, the you have to be careful how does the capacitor scaling get smaller. The interesting part is that you have plenty of routing. And so routing becomes basically capacitance to ground. So you can always add more into the into it. So there's a little interesting trade-off there, how you would work with that. That may have been too much detail. It may not have been the right answer or the answer to the question you're actually looking for, but I'm hoping I got close. I'm yeah, happy to clarify. So a related question is like, what's the range of time constants you can get? Yeah, okay. And yeah, I think that gives you a rough sense of where we are. Um, like I said, I, I think, like I said, sub one hertz doesn't seem to be too much of a problem. It's an interesting comment people might say, it was like, wait, when you scale down, you have all this you know, you know, on current leakage and so forth. But the nice part is with all the floating gate structures we use, you can actually program the floating gate actually outside the power supply rails. And so that actually opens up um, it effectively allows you to move your thresholds around in such a way that if you want to really turn stuff off, you can take a device and drive it all the way to accumulation and really make it off. And we, we do that pretty routinely. Um, okay. So that that actually tends to be very, very powerful for a number of different different concepts and techniques. Yeah. Okay, thanks. No, no, appreciate it. Really good question. Cool. Anything else? Or I'll continue. I'll continue. So the other, the conversation then became as we started to get into the configurable devices was, you know, starting to ask questions about, you know, what do we look at when we start talking about computing? And you know, digital systems tend to have the sort of flow of, you know, everything, eventually everything, when you pull up your laptop, you really have all the numerical engines, the algorithm order, you know, di digital blocks and so forth. Um, and, you know, it all kind of comes together with a nice Turing machine kind of theory. And so, you know, granted there's like a whole like CS degree behind all of this or CS or compi or whatever we define it these days as. Um, you know, degree that covers all of these kinds of concepts, right? And so a lot of this is built up, abstracted, worked around, and all that's great. When you start to talk about analog computing, and I'd argue for any sort of physical computing structure classically, what it tends to be is you start off with an interesting problem. Lots of people noodle over it. You go find an expert, you know, like Gert, and, uh, you know, thinks really hard about it, and a miracle occurs and out comes wonderful chips, right? Out comes really interesting circuits. And um, that works really well, but there aren't that many like super gur gurus who can just do this. And 
you can also see why people commercially would go, yeah, this is not a viable option. Uh, it's great for the you know people who know how to do this, but there aren't that many, and and um, it, it's kind of an unsustainable situation, and, and is at the heart of sort of even analog component design, and why there's a constant need for analog designers. One of the things we started to notice as we started building the configurable structures was it was actually working pretty well that we started having to actually either explain specific things or other pieces of some of the same kinds of framework of things that we'd see here in a digital computer, but in our sort of analog perspective and it'd always be bits and pieces and that would be, that would have its own struggles. Um, and so we started developing sort of theory around this um, and try to be, you know, try to be um, explicit about that. You know, starting from sort of the numeric side of it, which, you know, definitely gets into the question of both how do you deal with some of the computing as well as um, really what is the error propagation in that computing and how you talk about that. Um, there's a whole conversation of abstraction and how you think through the abstraction questions like we're kind of used to in digital. There's a whole sort of what does analog algorithm theory look like and how you start putting that on a, a solid framework. Um, and I would say that there's a start, good solid starting framework at this point now. Um, I do expect there will be far more um, happening, but at least it, it, something's there and there's something so, becoming solid. And some of this was just writing down what a few of the gurus who knew how to do this over the years sort of the, the, the thoughts and the practices there. And I think there's more to be done there by a long, by quite a bit. Um, but, and then you begin to sort of at a high level go, well, can I start talking about, you know, you know from a real valued or analog structure or so forth, you know, is there a computing model at the top in terms of, you know, Turing type of structure? And, and these really open up some really fascinating questions. These may not be the questions people are as interested in this conversation, but it's, it's, been an, actually a really incredible road to look through this um, to where each of those pieces, when you start going from numerical analysis to abstraction to architectures, all of them have very interesting points. And these are kind of the usual phrases, the way people talk about things like, you know, with analog that, you know, digital is perfect and analog's noisy and messy. And I'm like, well, yeah, but keep going with something in the chat. There we go. Oh, hey, Michael. Uh, I do have I do have at least one reference of where we started talking about it. I'd be happy to to put that in the chat when I'm when I'm out of this mode. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, happy to do it. Um, in terms of the conversations around that around the architectures, um, or out, I'm going to talk about architecture and there's algorithm questions sort of wrapped into that. Uh, I think algorithms a little. Well, algorithms part of it, so are part of architecture and complexity. Um, you know, there, there's the question of analog and digital, and I think this is always the phrase everyone who does analog always assumes that that's you know it's terrible. But the reality is, well, one, there's a whole sort of questions of the algorithms and how you know I, I like to think about how I teach an analog uh, numerical analysis class compared to how I teach a digital numerical analysis class, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, and what things come first, second, and third. It's one way to, way to look at that. And that gives you a sense of actually the complexity of the problem. Um, the conversation of abstraction, there's a lot of that. And how do you start to quantify and sort of look at that? As by the way, something we had to do with all the FBA structures because after all, we had to start building blocks to make it at all sane through the process. And then, you know, when you look at the architecture question, you know, it, it comes down to the sort of classical you know, classically in computer architectures, it's always about the processors, the big thing, and the, the uh, communication and all the memory stuff is just you know, kind of a side note. And it can be argued that what's really there is, a, is the communication is everything. And the processing, you know, be, because of the energy efficiency when basically it goes to zero. And that turns out to be very interesting from an architecture standpoint. Um, because oh, it's just communication between processors, which might be the way you think about it, but it actually turns out that the communication, the processors then gets actually compounded by the size of the memory. And the size of the memory is actually are directly in the order conversations of the complexity. That's kind of a big deal. And what it really tells you is that you really want your memory for these kinds of things distributed 
and comes back to the computing and memory mindset from, uh, from an architecture standpoint. Um, so we kind of look in those, those spaces there. Um, but all of these then build up to the conversation of, okay, so we start talking about physical sort of Turing machine which computes over reels versus digital stuff, computing over integers. And those are in quite different spaces. And asking the question of how those map, you know, there's different questions and those problems are things that are, you know, that you can solve in polynomial time versus things that are, in, you know, effectively MP classes and exponential time. And there's a bunch of others too. I mean, you know, there's a good CS person out there. You'll probably tell me there's a whole bunch of them and rightfully so, that's right. But how these things map is kind of interesting from, from here to here. It's very clear that, you know, that this does, the analog side doesn't get any worse because you can always make an analog thing look digital. So that, that takes care of that question. But is the space is expanded? And that's an, that is an interesting question. Um, I have my beliefs, but, um, you know, we can go from there. Uh, nothing has been proven yet in those spaces, so to be seen. Uh, lots of good thoughts and theories here, but comment. And I realized that um, I am act. You know, I, I think we were supposed to go for for about an hour, and I am just musing along here. <laughs> and um, shall I keep going? What's how's the timing supposed? To, how's the timing going to work here? I, I want to be appreciative of people's time because I have plenty of slides and I can always talk for a while. I think you can professor can do that. Hmm? Another 20 minutes. Okay, sure. And anyone who wants to jump in stuff, by all means, please do so. So yeah, and then there becomes all sorts of things of like how you get the, the connections between these. Uh, I won't spend too much more time on this unless anyone wants to jump into it. But it does turn out that once you start to talk about these as computing over real values, you realize there's um, connections across all of these, sort of all of these mechanisms, which is kind of neat actually. Um, and it turns out that, yeah, you can definitely go from, you know, a, a discrete valued problem to the continuous one, but going the other way is hard and is always an approximation. And this underlies really why we have such trouble with numerical stuff in differential equations and partial differential equations. And I think also we'll eventually, um, there'll be some other very key questions that come out of what this really means in the long run. So fun stuff. And you know, at that point, then I can start getting more and more into some of the neuromorphic stuff. Before I do that, let me just pause and make sure that I didn't miss any important comments or questions yet. So then when you get into the conversation and getting into the neuro, neuromorphic stuff, then you start to go, okay, I need to start working my way back in terms of grounding, you know, at low level um, sort of structures. And where do I begin with that? And the, the approach, at least that, you know, I kind of looked at over, over a while and seems to hold very, very well, is eventually realizing that if I look at sort of, you know, sort of a biological membrane inside and out, and I look at the structure. Um, I realize if I look at what's going on through the channel, it's a base, and I look at this carefully, it looks very much like what I would expect in a MOSFET and subthreshold. And when I say that, I mean, obviously there's one has ions and one has electrons and holes, and some, but okay, fine. But the main part is it's basically dealing with voltage control barriers. Um, and we can get deep into the, what the physical questions are there, but they both, it turns out if I look through at the edge of the channel, it's a voltage control barrier. If I look at what's going on through the channel and the membrane, it's a voltage control barrier. Um, someone might say, yes, but they open and close, you know, they have all these conformational changes and anyone who's taken OrgoChem, and I did get that opportunity once, I guess it was an opportunity. Um, you realize that obviously there's conformational changes that happen in a lot of organic molecules. But what's really, but it also turns out that basically how this energy barrier is looking in, in a sense across this is also, you know, ha also has an effect of how much that conformational change has happening. And so it, it seems like the zeroth order thing is actually the barrier, is the voltage barrier effectively through the structure. And the conformational change is the secondary, secondary issue on it. 
And, and that's actually kind of interesting because if you do that, then you really should be able to say, well, if that's really true, this was actually kind of the work we did um, nearly 20 years ago, that's really true, then that means I should be able to say this. I should be able to say, imagine I was with Hachin and Huxley in the 50s and I knew about transistors and subthreshold transistors because that's kind of the core of this. I should be able to sit down and actually, you know, sort of say, well, all right, I've got channel transistors for my channels, but then there's some gating mechanism, which we know is typically some sort of bio kind of molecule that acts kind of like a, a filter and amplifier structure that affects this channel potential based on the inside potential or chemicals or stuff, right? So like, all right, so how do you do that? And that was kind of the mindset of what we started with there was to say, well, imagine I have transistors in that form. Well, what is those dynamics that would give me that? And actually the way we approached it was went back to Hotsky's original data as if we were physically there and basically said, well, what do these, these voltages need to be if I was doing the voltage clamp experiments? Which if you think about a voltage clamp experiment from membrane voltage step, it's a step up or step down, to here is in for a double E basically means, oh, look, it's a step response, voltage in, voltage out. And it took some to kind of know how to invert through a transistor curve, but that was the way we approached it. And had sort of a different set of step responses and could build the circuits. <laughs> and so the circuits with all the nonlinear dynamics, as well as, you know, the, the steady states and stuff. And and that actually turned out to result in some very simple circuits uh, of which the entire structure with six transistors actually only had four state variables, but it had four state variables. Get all sorts of action potentials out of it. It was really neat structure. Um, and we could easily, you know, some very typical first order things just fell out very quickly. In fact, sometimes annoyingly so. Um, you know, having noise on, the classic experiment having noise on, a, on an element just below threshold. And so the neuron would start firing was something that we would see all the time. And it actually made taking FI curves in silicon almost as annoying as it would be to do an FI curve in, an, in a biological prep. And so you could see that quite well. The interesting part of it was, is that by starting this, it allowed you also then to extend this out into dendrites but also extend out the conversation into synapses. It's particularly for the single transistor learning synapse concepts to where you, know, you could imagine building things, even circuits that could be out on the edge, edges of it, so not in the middle of a dense array and still getting really nice EPSPs as well as also getting STDB curves for those not familiar with it, it just, it's a timing sort of learning. Imagine you know, has its, that has a lot of roots in San Diego and uh, you know, good stuff. Um, but being able to do these in very, very tight structures, but also then realize there's some really good biological, some ways to kind of take this approach and then still be able to use it to actually do, you know, interpret what's going on biologically or in the neuroscience. So that sort of tight connection helps build as we go work our way up. Um, there's something else that was kind of an interesting point to this that it's an interesting thing, right? Because we, again, it gets back to the computing questions. Um, obviously, you know, in analog or physical systems and neuromorphic, we're dealing with ODE solutions. So that works out a little bit nicer. It, there's something very important to that because when we talk about digital modeling, we typically talk about, um, you know, the complexity, our sense of complexity of a neuron model is very much tied to how we do things in digital and how we do things with digital computing. So you might talk about you know, how, many, how many multiply accumulates do I need per you know, each ODE iteration step, right? And simple integrating fire is one, and then there's a couple simpler integrate, there's some simple ones that get a little more complicated. Um, if you look at Eugene Zikovich's model against sort of log scale, that's probably about 30-ish, give or take. I'm sure somebody's gonna go, no, it's 23. Okay, fine, close enough, we'll go with that. Um, and then if you actually do the calculations for Hodgkin Huxley model in terms of taking their original equations, it's, it's more than a thousand for every iteration step. And the thing is, as you have more calculations, you also run the risk of things getting more stiff and, and so on and so forth. So this, the steps are even increasing. So this gets worse and worse. And this, 
is I think a good way of thinking our perception of neural com com uh, complexity, to which we think, yeah, we, you know, if we can be integrated in fire, that makes life a lot easier because Hodgkin is just so hard. Uh, we'd rather not go there. Although, you know, maybe there's some benefits, although since we don't spend a lot of time, we don't always see it. It's kind of a funny thing on the analog side when I look at a structure like this, because I'm like, well, an integrating fire structure, looking at like what you get in Carver Mead's book, it would be six to seven transistors. Uh, might be able to do it in five, but let's just argue this for a moment. Um, but if I do the Hodgkin-Huxley model, it's also six to seven transistors. And you think, wait a minute, that isn't the trade-off I expected. And there's a couple more caps and there's a few more biases or parameters to tune, although not quite as many as you might think actually. And in fact, the, there's some questions of whether Hodgkin and Huxley's model is actually over-specified or has too many parameters actually for what's actually being modeled. <laughs> but it's an interesting thing that these, these things don't shift as much as you would think they would. And I think this has a lot to do with actually dealing with the physical computation and as you start getting more and more complicated structures, starting to do dendrites and multiple networks of neurons, this has a huge impact as we go forward on it. So something to think about there. Um, let me pause for a second. Any comments, questions as I am trying to through things? Is it the case also for other means of physical computations? Like like quantum and other things. Like, do you have any idea for how those trade-off like plays in different um, um, traits? The trade-off does see you do seem to see some similar things in in, in other in other areas. <laughs> um, one of the things that buy that you are buy, that you buy with some of the analog structures is that some of the nonlinearities come directly. And further, a lot of physical processes that you're modeling often are exponentials that have, you know, typical, uh, that have the same, even the same sort of um, voltage levels and so forth. The, the reason that this worked though is that this was something we were very careful about modeling and using voltage ranges that looked like they're by, like the biological ranges. So how to put it, it, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of ways to write bad digital code there's a lot of ways to write bad analog code too, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and so that that's part of it, but it does seem like these kinds of conversations show up in other places. Um, and I would imagine if we started, you know, I, I imagine one could very quickly look at this across a whole range of different types of com computing. And by the way, this is just sort of simple. Uh, this is a, you know, a low order ODE problem. Right. As soon as you start talking, you know, partial differential equations, it gets even more pronounced um, in many of these cases. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, no, really good point. So kind of neat stuff. Um, and then you can start getting into synapses and I'll, you know, there's a lot I could say here. I'm gonna go through a couple of things quickly because I realize I don't wanna, wanna at least make sure everyone has a taste of what I'm talking about. There's lots of good things with the synapses, lots of things in the single transistor stuff, coming back to it, yay, a paper I know well. Um, and I'll put that together. The cool thing is you can start then doing this and putting this into networks, things like winner take all networks. This was one of the ones that was um, just a simple con thing that was compiled with Hodgkin Huxley neurons. We actually built a full, uh, it was about a hundred neurons that were fully connected and, and with SVP and all, a whole bunch of things in it. But you can definitely get a whole bunch of like nice inputs for these different neurons and then look at, uh, there's one inhibitory neuron is 46, uh, which is the, the, and again, it's a very simple model, but what you can start to see is you can definitely see how these things work as well as the fact that you're refining the data. Small dots are inputs, large dots are outputs and you can definitely set it up. It's what you would expect because you would expect your inhibition to be strong. So it's actually sort of, pushing back on things and really doing good data refinement, which is kind of what you would expect. You might go, well, why, is, why are these kind of networks interesting? Well, one of the more interesting ones is, uh, you know, actually saying, let's take this a similar sort of structure, but now just sort of neurons and it looks more like sort of 2D synfire chains, 
but with various breaks in it for where you are in a path. And you say, I want to look, go from say 22 to 77 or bat or the other way. And you want to figure out how you're going to get there. And this turns out to be interesting because you can actually then start getting sort of neural propagation from one end to the other. And this, again, the way this sort of came out for us, we had one person in my group looking at, you know, resistive um, structures and grids for this, uh, resistive grids and another person actually building the network and got the data above. And they said, you know, I wonder what happens if we put this together. And it turned out it actually not only sort of worked, but it worked really well. The Hachinatsu version of the neurons was exactly what you wanted because you make really, really good sinfire chains out of Hachinatsu structures. And then basically you're looking for basically the fastest path. Um, and the fastest path is the, is the optimal path. And it's interesting exactly where does this sit in computational complexity? Because at one level, it feels like Dijkstra's algorithm, which still pretty darn good, you know, this is all done in, in polynomial resources, but it's actually been more complicated than Dijkstra's algorithm when you look at it closely. And so exactly playing it is interesting, but you can prove it's always optimal. Um, and there's a lot of very interesting complexity questions to ask around these things. And I find it really fascinating how some of these networks of neurons can start to look at questions and maps. And there's a whole lot that you can build into that. Um, yeah, quick question. How am I doing on time? Maybe like five more minutes. Okay. Well, at this point, well, let me see. What else was I going to talk about? Yeah, the other things I was going to get into is going to be more into some of the dendritic stuff and dendritic computation questions, um, which I'm happy to do. But what I think I will do is I will just kind of pause at this. And I'm happy to do that. If people want to jump into it, I'm happy to do it. Um, but I think what I'll do, and just as likely, and I'll leave it in terms of the conclusion of stuff. Obviously, obviously, the, the circuits and the tools are both very critical. But you know, again, the end is, I'm rather fascinated by you know the sort of computing questions, and I think there's a huge amount of opportunity. And I think if you take nothing else away, with all of the sort of physical computing structures, there's a huge amount of what we can do going forward. Um, we there's so much that's possible, and I think will continue to have opportunities um, pretty much you know, driven by lots of creative people going forward. So I, I'll just open it up to questions at this point. And again, I appreciate everyone's time. This is so much fun. I've enjoyed this. So please ask your questions directly. Like, don't need to. Yeah. I was wondering if you could tell a little bit more about uh, for people that are perhaps not as um, familiar with neuromorphic uh, circuits, like in terms of um, connections, not only synapses, but like connections, like uh, in terms of mm. axons, what also like might be the, <clears throat> what are the advantages actually of analog designs versus digital designs? Because uh, not for, everyone for, I think for, is very uh, familiar with neuromorphic circuits. Uh, yeah. To also develop on, on, the, on that aspect, if you could, shortly, like just briefly. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, clearly, I mean, obviously, we talked about synapses. Uh, obviously, there's a lot with the dendritic com components and so forth, which there's some really neat, neat possibilities there as well. Um, when you start looking at axon lines, uh, obviously, there's a lot of, there's multiple pieces there, one of which gets you, uh, you know, I, the nice thing is that axons are primarily two level type of asynchronous structures. So it gives you a lot of interesting things. You can even you know, utilize asynchronous digital structures for those elements. Um, and that also kind of helps in terms of trying to make delays along those lines. Um, and there, there is some importance to some axonal delays. I, I'd probably argue there's a lot more importance to some of the dendritic delays. Uh, but what's nice is the axonal part is actually usually pretty straightforward because it feels Typically digital or digital-ish. Um, there, there are people who will believe that some of the axon, some of the analog stuff in the axon is important, but it, it tends to be less so. Uh, that's certainly for sure. And obviously, I'm, I'm looking at the primary electrical systems. I, I didn't even start to get into questions like what did glial cells do. Uh, of course, I didn't get into the dendritic stuff except to barely touch it. 
Um, there's there's a lot there's a lot possible, and yet at the same time, there's so we know so much. I mean, there's so much we don't know, but we know so much, and a lot of that can be utilized towards a, a lot of these computing stru- computing directions. Um, I think the other thing on the digital side, because it's or because the axons, because it's digital, you can do a lot of interesting digital tricks with um, both routing, you know, doing local routing, with also doing treating asynchronous events, doing address event structures in the sense of encoding, you know, when something happens and saying, let me just send an address. Um, that works out really well in many cases, particularly in very sparse, longer distance communication lines. When it's a lot of local, less sparse communication, not as obvious how that plays. Um, the other really big issue then also is how do we eventually talk about rerouting of neurons, or rerouting of axons? And we know that axons certainly grow and change. And that's really an interesting question of which I think it's still not really well developed in the neuromorphic space. And partially because I think we know that it's the postsynaptic potentials, particularly in the dendritic cables, that are extremely important in terms of defining where the growth tones of where axons go. And so there's, so unless you get the sort of main feed forward computation right in groups of neurons, it's hard to make the rest of it behave. Um, and so I think there's still a lot for us to explore. Another question? Yes, please. Um, what do you perceive to be the potential for uh, some company to pick up these ideas and turn it commercial for field programmable analog neural networks? Uh, my art, my thought these days is the thought of being able to take these ideas and make something commercial in an FBA space is highly possible. I think doing the same sort of thing for certain, um, for end-to-end kind of neuromorphic systems where you can go from sensor to classifier, I think I think that's also huge. I think they're both, I think they're really untapped spaces that there's so much possible things that are there, particularly with it, so much interest in computing in the, at the edge these days. I think that's computing at the edge where, where energy efficiency is going to be very important. I mean, it's important in a server too, but you can kind of hide it a little bit. In this case, I think it's just so, such a big opportunity. And um, I, Do you I see don't many think, companies don't showing interest? What is that? Do you see many companies showing interest? Are they knocking on your door? Large companies are always slow to do anything innovative, right? Yeah. I think that's the thing, and you see, you see a little bit finally. I think now, but I, I think here, as it is in most cases, most of the innovative techniques usually get go through startup companies and get acquired. Mostly because bigger okay. companies are scared of the overall initial cost risk. Yeah, I, I think that's just the reality of it, and I think it's become more the reality recently than it would have been, say, 30 years ago. Um, I think most companies are very risk averse, unfortunately. And I mean, I I don't blame them. I know what they have. I see what they have to deal with. So I get it. For for, for me, as one who really likes building new technology and seeing it being used everywhere, it also has its frustrations. Well, you you used to have large companies like uh... AT&T that could support a research operation like Bell Labs and you knew that they they weren't going to dry up anytime soon because they had a lot of cash flow to keep it going. But you got companies like Intel, they could be uh, overwhelmed by an AMD uh, at yeah. the drop of a hat like they have been. Right. Right. Well, and, and AT&T was a special thing, right? Because they were kind of a regulated monopoly at the yeah. time. And they had to um, show that they didn't make too much profit. And part of Bell Labs was a way to show they didn't make too much profit while still going <laughs> back to the company. I mean, that was point blank why they did it. Once they, they got broken up, once Bell Labs got, or once ETT got broken up, you notice Bell Labs started to fade. Yeah. I think that's part of it. So 
what is the answer to that I don't know but yeah I would look I I would love to see a Bell Labs which then things spun out and people saw a resource for it and um, maybe there's some other things there maybe we'll find some PCs who are very enthusiastic about this kind of stuff and we can all get this to happen and maybe you know on the side we'll all turn out to be rich that would be great okay Thank uh, you. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> no, good points though. Other questions? Mm, I will ask something else if no one has a question. I mean, I'll, I'll stay on the line if people want to talk for a few more minutes, that's fine. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to, to end. I'm not going time. anywhere. No, for like at least five, 10 minutes. Uh, I would like yeah, everyone yeah. to make sure that everyone can ask their questions. Uh, yeah, no, I was exactly. wondering about the, the potential of hybrid system, like combining like FBA with digital uh, counterpart, like or some other things. Are there people doing work on that? Like the same <sighs> way, like a little bit that you used to do, like uh, kind of Gertz, uh, like things where he was using digital and analog, like mixed digital analog. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, I think that that's certainly possible. And with the FBA stuff, it makes sense. Um, one of the reasons it makes sense, at least to me on the FBA side, is that, um, you know, there is a processor on there, right? There, there is a small, there's a 16-bit processor, there is SRAM. Uh, there are, there's a whole FPGA type of fabric that we've built out of floating gates that's also interdigitated with it. So, I mean, I could turn all the analog stuff off and make it be one interesting, you know, interesting FPGA and go, oh, what's there? So I, I think that the opportunity is there. And then the question becomes, okay, if that's true, um, you know, we, it really gives us a beautiful platform then to ask a question about, well, um, you know, what should the right algorithms be, right? Um, you know, in the same platform. And I think that's kind of a huge deal, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's one of the ways I would look at the question. Okay. By the way, the, Michael, uh, you asked the question on the analog algorithms. I gave you at least one reference, but if you'd like to talk more about it, I'll even talk offline on all of this stuff. Nothing. I don't even know what questions I have. So I'm, I'm excited to, to figure. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I put it in the chat. So if it's needed, it's there. Um, that's cool. Um, by the way, I and I'll just say I appreciate the, the opportunity for the conversation. This has been fun. It was good that Gerd jumped in for a little bit. And uh, I'm sure it'd have been fun had we gone further on the topic he brought up briefly. There's a lot of history there to be talked about. Um, and uh, I've always enjoyed interacting with him and all the stuff we've done there. Both of us I think it's important school. for people to know a little bit uh, where those things come from. Uh, it's nice that you cover like some overview of the, the origins of those uh, another yeah. company. Yeah. And I, I try to keep trying to work through history to make sure that we, it kind of gets remembered. And, and as people bring up other points, like, oh, wait, did you remember this? Like, oh, well, okay, let's find a way to make sure we say it properly. Um, I, I think that's always important. The no, history of science is always amazing. It's uh, always fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some knowing of where, you, where you've come tells you a lot of where you're going. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, any other questions by anybody on? Please yeah, don't last be shy. Questions, like last couple of questions. If you have uh, anything to ask, like please do it now. I think people are leaving. So Every, I think everybody seems to. Yeah. Well, it seemed like we had a really good group turnout of people. So that was awesome. <laughs> Thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I enjoyed this and. Anyone wants to talk further, just, you know, just email me. I'll be happy to talk further. Hopefully people will. Have a great holiday break. Thank you. You have a great holiday as well. It's great seeing you again. Yeah, thank you.
Okay, so yeah, we'll uh, I will end the session. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.